welcome to another episode of the Idea Me Show. I'm Amanda Christensen, an Idea Me guest contributor, marketing manager at Kubaka, as well as a tech and data ethics researcher. I have the pleasure of being joined today by Ilan Komargotsky, research scientist at the Cryptography and Information Security Lab at NTT Research. Uh, Ilana, it'd be great if you could tell me a bit about your background and how you became interested in information security. Hi Amanda, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So a little bit about my background. At some point during my high school, one of the teachers had a huge influence on my life, on how my life was shaped. She suggested that I take extracurriculum classes in some sort of university. And I got really into computer science back then. Uh, I was really into uh, programming back then. And I was really fascinated by computers. I guess it was the early 2000s. So I finished my bachelor. I joined the army. I, was, uh, I joined the army in Israel. And I was, there. I was a software engineer for five years. And I really, really loved the subject. But then I thought that uh, it, will, it will be much more interesting at that point to do fundamental research in computer science and not to program. I, I thought that, that might be interesting to try out because that's something that I haven't done before. So I started my master's degree in the Weizmann Institute in computer science. And somehow I smoothly continued to a PhD in computer science also in the Weizmann Institute. And I really liked it. Uh, it made my life much more interesting and much more full than uh, anything else that I've done before. So I decided to pursue a career in, in uh, research. I did a postdoc at uh, Cornell, Cornell Tech in New York City, which I finished uh, about a year ago. And since then I'm part of NTT Research, uh, where I am a scientist. Could you tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing at the CIS labs at NTT? So NTT Research, uh, maybe I'll give a slightly more high-level overview of NTT Research in a couple of sentences. So NTT Research is a new company that was founded a year ago, uh, roughly when I joined, or exactly when I joined. And NTT Research is focused on doing fundamental research in several areas of science. And the, the company chose to focus on three fields. So one lab is a physics lab. The other lab is uh, a medical and information uh, lab. And the last lab, which I am part of, is the com uh, cryptography and information security. I will focus on the CIS lab because I'm part of that lab and I know much more about it. So our lab, the CIS lab, is, is composed of two groups. Uh, one group does fundamental research in cryptography, uh, ranging from very theoretical works in cryptography to things that are more practical, both in quantum cryptography and classical cryptography. We'll, I guess, touch upon these uh, topics a bit later. And the other group under our lab is the blockchain group, which is intimately related to cryptography nowadays. Uh, and there we're doing research on blockchains, fundamental research on blockchains, and how they can affect and should affect our uh, life. I am part of uh, the CIS lab, as like I said, uh, and more specific part of the cryptography group. In my work in the last, I guess, uh, seven years uh, has been about fundamental research in theoretical computer science with a strong emphasis on cryptography. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit what it means to do uh, fundamental research in cryptography. I guess that uh, cryptography is the science that uh, that studies the question of how to perform our daily operations, the things that we're doing on a daily basis, but doing them while preserving some form of privacy about what we did and what, and what is the information that we used to do this operation. And more specifically, what we're doing in, in foundational cryptography, we're trying to model these uh, scenarios that people are doing on a, on a daily basis. And we're trying to devise uh, solutions based on cryptographic ideas and mathematical ideas uh, to allow people to do the same operations while preserving some sort of privacy about, uh, about them. That's really interesting because that kind of links in. I mean, there's a lot of news going on at the minute about the, the data breach on Twitter, the data concerns with TikTok as well globally. 
um, the kind of increase in scams uh, during coronavirus as well, um, but particularly the kind of uh, either miseducation, misinformation, or just kind of lack of awareness around uh, the, the kind of everyday digital footprint that we have. Right, that's completely correct. And this is, I guess, I guess that in recent years, uh, it's been more and more and more uh, evident that we are giving away a lot of our private information, even when we're navigating, navigating to work in the morning. It's whatever service you're using to navigate knows where you live, knows where you work, knows how, how you drive there, knows what the, what's the time you're going there. And there's basically a lot of information that uh, is leaked about us even if we don't really realize it. So sometimes when people uh, fill a form online, they, they know in the back of their heads that they're giving up that information. But sometimes we're doing things that we're, it's not really clear to us that we're giving a lot of information about us, but actually we are. And there's been lots of studies showing that even though you're not giving very specific information about yourself from the metadata, metadata that you are giving up, uh, actually, a lot of information can be inferred about you. There's lots of examples uh, about how, um, for example, how, uh, how naive techniques of uh, anonymizing medical records don't really work. Uh, no. So if you take a, me a medical record and you remove the name, it doesn't really make it uh, private. It's still really easy to link it to that person, even if the name is, del is deleted. Right, it is that kind of kind of web of information, for lack of a lack of a better term, on the web. But all of these kind right. of data points that connect us and just anonymizing one part of this information doesn't necessarily mean that your information isn't out there and being shared or being sold. Right, you're completely right. So, for example, one one thing we're doing nowadays in cryptography, which I think is uh, really cool. We we're trying to really model these new uh, scenarios of what people are doing with their data. So today we are doing with our data things that we haven't been doing in the past. Uh, cryptography started with a very simple task of me sending information to you over some digital uh, channel. Mm -hmm. And the, back then, 40, 50 years ago, uh, this question was the only thing that, uh, or almost the only thing that the people cared about that how can we transit and transmit information from party A, which is on one side of the globe, to party B, which is on some other part of the globe, assuming that the channel where the information passes is uh, malicious or is tampered somehow. This was a really huge question. It's still a huge question even today, but we have great solutions for this question, and every, every one of us is using those solutions uh, when we go on a website. Uh, but today we're actually modeling much more complicated scenarios. Uh, for instance, uh, I have information, but you are offering some service. So for instance, I'm going to some, uh, to some service online and I'm asking them to do some computation on my data because they are offering some service. Uh, for instance, it could be some uh, machine learning service that they can do on my information, or it could be some any st other statistical computation that they, they can do or anything else. And today we are, building, we are building tools, cryptographic tools, to allow users and uh, service providers to do these kinds of, uh, of services for us without really sending them our private information. It's fascinating. So when you're talking about that, are you talking about the kind of research that you're doing into homomorphic encryption? Right, so homomorphic encryption is just one example of uh, how to do these kinds of, uh, of modern, modern cryptographic scenarios. So homomorphic encryption is this new and exciting tool that we have in cryptography. It's been around for, the concept has been around for like 40, 50 years, but uh, we've only known how to really implement it in the last, uh, I guess, 12 years, maybe 11 years. Uh, so this is a really exciting concept which is really hard to grasp in the beginning because classical cryptographic uh, primitives like encryption schemes uh, and digital signatures and things like that have physical analogs. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, an encryption scheme could be that 
uh, I, I put my, uh, my message in a box and there is a key, right? And I give you the, the box and you have the key. So only you can open the box. So many cryptographic primitives have physical analogs, but homomorphic encryption is really unique in that it's like I put my message in a box, so I encrypt it, but then I can still perform computations on it without uh, decrypting it. So without opening the box, I can manipulate the data, the data under which is inside that box, inside that encryption, and I can uh, compute any function that I want on that data. The result will be, again, a box with the computation output that I did. Uh, so this is, it sounds a bit magical, how can you do something like that? But uh, the, the, the nature of the mathematical tools that uh, we use to implement uh, homomorphic encryption magically allows us, allow us to do that. And so this is a really huge advancement in the last, uh, I guess, 10 years that we've had, which resulted in immense progress in many, many other uh, big questions that we have in cryptography. And this is indeed one of the things that, uh, one of the great successes, I guess, in the last decade of cryptography. And I, as far as I know, this is also uh, implemented to some extent in practice and people are actually using it in real life. So it started off as something really theoretical, which was far from being uh, impractical to implement, but today, there are uh, implementations which are really efficient. How does that kind of filter in, like what you were saying earlier, where we kind of have to sacrifice a little bit of our data or a lot of our data um, when we're going through kind of day-to-day -day functions? Um, how does this impact accessibility and functionality with these new tools? So this is exactly one of, it gives you a solution to some of the problems that I raised. You can Instead of uh, instead of sending instead of sending your data to some service provider who gives you some service and compute something for you, you can encrypt your data. Let the service provider do the do the computation on the encrypted data, and send it back to you. And thereby, the service provider doesn't learn anything about your data. It could be anything. I'm I'm only, I'm giving a very abstract. Uh, uh, application, but it could be anything that you have in mind. It could be a doctor that sees your medical record, which is encrypted, and he wants to only know if you have a high chance of getting some disease or something like that. So th these are the, the list of applications is really endless. It's really endless. And this is also a really useful for um, for co compliance with uh, with uh, with legal with legal uh, entities like GDPR and, uh, and, and things like that, which really uh, require us to not publish uh, sensitive information online. Right? This is one of the, one of the requirements of, of these things. The tools that we are building really should really be, able, should really be important to implement uh, such solutions that are compliant with GDPR and similar uh, policies. Our lab is really uh, diverse and we're doing lots of different things, but specifically uh, I, I'll say a couple of words about the things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing uh, work mostly related to secure computation, uh, which means uh, the following. Uh, at least very classically what secure computation means is that uh, a set of people uh, have uh, their own inputs. So let's say that me and you and somebody else have their own input for some joint function that we want to compute. And we want to compute it over the internet or uh, even when we meet each other, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we want to compute it while preserving privacy of our own inputs. So for instance, uh, think about uh, me, you and somebody else and we want to compute who's earning the most, whose salary is, uh, is the highest. So the naive solution is just, I will tell you how much I earn, you will tell me how much you earn, and maybe the third person will also tell us how much he earns, and, and we'll know who earns the most. But during this process, we, we just published how much we earn, and this might not be so, we might not be so happy about it, right? Right. 
So secure computation gives you a, a solution to these kinds of problems. Uh, we can compute who we can compute who earns the most without ever leaking our inputs, without ever telling us telling you who tell, telling anyone how much we earn. Uh, so this is the main or the very simple example of what secure computation is. It's very related, of course, to homomorphic encryption. And it's very related to other things in cryptography. But this is the, I guess, main field of research that I'm working on in the past uh, two years. So, so in these scenarios, um, I'm, I'm assuming this relies on more of a decentralized model of data storage rather than a centralized model. Am I, am I correct to that? Right, of course, yeah. If the if there is a centralized data storage that stores all of the all of our salaries, it could just tell us who is earning the most. So indeed, the main the main hardness in in this question comes from the fact that there is no central entity who we trust to store our data. We trust only ourselves, and this is the, something that comes up in many new scenarios that we're hearing about. Maybe most known, known as the blockchains and Bitcoin, but this is something that comes up in cryptography in many in many settings. Yeah. Basically, it's exactly what you, you said. It's a very good way to explain what cryptography is. It's re reducing the amount of trust in, in somebody who is not you. So it's kind of a, a new age and functionality in data diplomacy, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. If there is somebody who we trust with our data, then cryptography is not needed. We just trust that entity with our data and we can send her the, our data. But Cryptography is really intended to avoid trust. <laughs> well, really just kind of, kind of safeguarding everything. Um, so looking ahead, uh, I saw that you're going to be joining the School of Computer Science and Engineering at the Hebrew University. Can you tell me a little bit about the work you're going to be doing uh, there? It's actually really similar. Um, since we're doing uh, fundamental research in computer science, this is very intimately related or intimate, there is lots of intimate relationships with universities. Because this is very similar to what universities are doing, or actually the same. All of us in the, in the entity research uh, team are academics in some way or the other. Uh, so this is actually a great combination to be part of a university and entity research because then you get access to uh, resources which are more academic like more uh, students and other resources that are needed to perform theoretical research. And you also get the amazing tools that Entity Research is providing uh, as a company, which has more resources, that, like different resources. So at IDME, we, we really value the, the concept of rich connections, people who champion one another along their journey. Um, is there anyone that you'd like to give a special shout out to? Anyone that's helped shape your career or who you are as a person? I know you mentioned earlier when you were discussing your background, um, that teacher from all of those years back kind of suggesting that you look into this path. Yeah, so that, that's one. Uh, which I will, already mentioned, and I guess more recent influ influencers uh, are my, um, I guess my PhD advisor has a huge influence on me in the way that I do research. Uh, it's Professor Nino from Weizmann Institute, uh, so has a huge influence on me in the way that I'm shaped as a researcher. Um, and, and that's it. Yeah, my parents, I guess, did a good job raising me. <laughs> it's always, always a good answer. Always, always makes your parents happy as well <laughs> when they listen in. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today, Lon. It's been absolutely fascinating hearing about all of the kind of potential implications and where we will hopefully be heading in terms of data encryption um, and, and making sure that our, our data privacy is a little bit more secure going forward in our day to day. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking the time and thank you for, as we like to say on IDME, moving the human story forward. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.